Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And what a nice turnout and response. We're thrilled to be partnering with RVNA, our longtime sponsors who are very important in the life of stay at home in Wilton. Um, we thank you for participating not only in this event, but in the other one with all of the beautiful gift bags and everything that uh, make this event memorable. Um, my name is Sally Maraventano Kermser, and um, I'm president of Stay at Home in Wilton, I guess now for about two years, two and a half years. And um, your, your guest um, MD today is my husband of 52 and a half years, who will talk to you about uh, various heart situations and uh, answer questions for you, which is very important. Don't be shy. Um, we are excited whenever we can do something to serve the community. And I think that uh, partnering with our um, nursing um, uh, divisions is very, very important because most people at some point will need their services. So Ralph and I are a residents of Wilton for 42 years. We moved here after he um, finished all of his training. Ralph is a graduate of Yale Medical School, class of 1971. And um, uh, he did uh, his internship and residency down south at Medical College of Virginia to have a taste of a big city hospital after having done his training at Yale. But he did go back to Yale for his cardiac training and um, uh, got his fellowship there. And um, we decided to travel one hour south from, um, from Yale so that we'd be a little closer for the grandparents who were anxious to see our three children as well as all the other grandchildren. Uh, there, I think there were 10 of them all together. So uh, Ralph has practiced uh, cardiology at Norwalk Hospital and uh, with his group that he'll explain to you for all of those years. It's been a great, great life that we have here and we love all the people in the community. Wilton's a wonderful, wonderful community and we raised our three children here. So without any other introduction, here's Ralph Kermser. Ask him as many questions as you can. Hello. <laughs> I, think I think the schedule is to start with uh, the RVNA uh, talks, and then uh, I'll say uh, something uh, towards the end uh, of their presentation. Yes, let me um, just thank the RVNA for um, everything they did with the gift bags today and for presenting today. I want to introduce Laura Cordera, Director of Community Health and Wellness and she will do the introductions for RVNA Health. So let's welcome RVNA Health. Hi, thank you so much, Debbie. And thank you so much, Stay at Home Wilton for, for having us today. Um, we have an exciting presentation, or I think it's exciting. I hope you find it exciting too. It's gonna be three parts. So the first part will be about keeping track of your blood pressure at home, something that's particularly important now that most of us uh, have been home for so long. Uh, through this pandemic. Then we're gonna have a great presentation about grip strength and how that correlates with your heart health. And then we're gonna have a, a really wonderful and relaxing session on meditation. So the first session, I'm gonna introduce you to your speaker and that is Jill Hart. She is an LPN and she's been a nurse for 22 years serving in both short-term and long-term care. She's been doing community health and, and uh, outreach specifically for 16 years, ho hosting blood pressure clinics, providing community education, and working with senior populations. Uh, she's currently pursuing her bachelor's degree in psychology at Post University with a concentration in health and development, and she's hoping to go on for her master's after that. And outside of work, Jill is a professional road tripper and a lover of kitties. <laughs> So she is going to be talking to you about how to keep track of your blood pressure at home. So I'm going to turn things over to her. Okay. Hi. All right. So let me switch over. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see everybody's faces and not behind a mask. I'm going to flip over to share my screen and hopefully I can get this 
correct. Let's see. Can you see it? Nope. Oh, not yet. Is that it? You got it? Nope, not yet. Okay. What are you looking for? Share screen. There we go. There you go. All right. Blood pressure, yes. So, can you see the whole screen or? There we go. Sorry, my apologies. Okay, blood pressure. All right. What is blood pressure? Blood pressure um, is determined by the amount of blood that your heart pumps and the pressure that it exerts against the walls of your arteries. Uh, blood pressure is measured in two numbers. Uh, the systolic, which is the number at the top that measures the blood pressure in your arteries when your heart beats. The, the diastolic is the number at the bottom, which would be the 80 in the photo. And that measures the pressure in your artery when your heart rests between beats. High blood pressure is also known as hypertension. There are two types of hypertension. There's primary and secondary. Uh, most cases are classified as primary hypertension, and this is diagnosed when there isn't an identifiable secondary cause. Uh, and this tends to develop gradually over years. Secondary hypertension is when there's another cause, um, such as a kidney disease, thyroid problems, or other healthcare uh, problems. Uh, sometimes also medications can increase your blood pressure, some pain medications, some types of cold medications, uh, some antidepressants. Uh, this tends, the secondary hypertension tends to develop suddenly uh, and causes a higher pressure reading than primary hypertension. Uh, blood pressure changes throughout the day based on your activities, uh, what you eat and your stress levels. Caffeine, sometimes watching the news, <laughs> other things <laughs> will affect your blood pressure. Um, having your blood pressure measured consistently above normal, say if you've had it measured three times or more during the course of a week, and it's not because of new meds or, or new, you know, of caffeine or increased stress levels, once that happens and it's consistently measured above normal, you will result in a diagnosis of high blood pressure or hypertension. Um, Blood pressure should generally be checked in both arms, and it's important to use the right size cuff. They have a lot of good electronic cuff choices out there. You can get them at Walgreens or CVS. I uh, don't recommend the wrist ones. I find that when I use the wrist cuffs, it results in a higher reading than if you use the arm cuff. High blood pressure usually doesn't have any warning signs or symptoms. Uh, many people don't even know they have it. Some people experience you know, headaches, shortness of breath, uh, nosebleeds, but these aren't specific signs and uh, they usually don't occur until it's reached severe or life-threatening stages. Okay, some of the factors that contribute to hypertension are age, as we age, our blood pressure naturally increases, but unhealthy lifestyle uh, choices will add to this. Sleep apnea um, results in increased blood pressure and um, stress in your heart and lungs, and sleep apnea is linked to an amplified risk of hypertension. Kidney disease uh, and stress. Uh, stress mostly raises your blood pressure in the short term, but can lead to long-term changes uh, in blood pressure and overall health. Uh, some of the more negative lifestyle choices that affect blood pressure and maybe that are things we have more control over are a lack of exercise, obesity, uh, poor diet. Um, actually, each pound of fat uh, requires approximately a mile of extra blood vessels and that will increase your blood pressure as well. Um, salt, uh, as we get older, we tend to lose some of our taste buds and maybe mm -hmm. we're using more salt than we uh, think that we are. Um, eating out um, 
probably doesn't help. I know that eating out uh, is a good, con a great con contribution to higher salt intake levels. Uh, smoking raises your blood pressure, and over time, it damages the lining of your blood vessels. Uh, alcohol, uh, having more than three drinks in one sitting will temporarily raise your blood pressure, but repeated binge drinking uh, can lead to long-term increases. I think that's pretty much all of us in 2020 there on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what can you do to prevent or manage high blood pressure? Uh, most people can change or manage their high blood pressure uh, when they make lifestyle changes, like the eating better. Um, getting at least 150 minutes of physical activity each week, that's roughly about 30 minutes a day. And that doesn't mean hitting the gym. Uh, it could also be things that you enjoy, like dancing or yard work or walking around the mall if it's too cold to walk outside. Um, the trick is to pick something that you like to do because then it makes it easier to stick to. You know, if you don't want to go to the gym, forcing yourself to go there 30 minutes a day isn't going to be enjoyable. But if you like dancing and maybe classes will be opening up soon, that's something that, uh, you know, makes it easier to be active with. Uh, not smoking, uh, eating a healthier diet, uh, and that includes more cooking at home, keeping a healthy weight. I mean, managing stress, which this is, like I said, has probably been the hardest year for anybody to manage their stress levels. Um, let's see. There is also low blood pressure, which is called hypotension. And generally it's 90 to over 60 or less is considered low blood pressure. Um, some people generally run low and it's usually not a problem unless it's symptomatic. It can be from underlying diseases or medication, symptoms, dizziness, fainting, fatigue, blurred or fading vision. There are also some medications that uh, cause hypotension, some anti-seizure meds, uh, some sedatives for anxiety. So what can you do when you suffer from hypotension? If you have something called orthostatic hypotension, that's when you get up too quickly and your blood pressure drops. So recommendations for that are sitting up slowly and then instead of just jumping from laying down to jumping off the couch, say to answer your phone, maybe go from sitting and then go to standing position. Um, you wanna stay hydrated. If you normally run low, but you're experiencing symptoms, dizziness, headaches, uh, call your doctor. And also it's good to be aware of the side effects of the medications that you are taking. So some important tidbits um, to remember are, pick something that you enjoy doing. If you love dancing, that could be your go-to for lowering your weight, which will help decrease your blood pressure. Um, just five to 10 pounds of weight loss will start to have positive effects on your blood pressure. Uh, changing your diet habits, do it slowly. Um, you can't expect to drop all your bad uh, dietary habits in one day. That makes it harder to stick to. If you're just all of a sudden no sugar and no caffeine, you're going to end up with a headache and then you probably won't stick to it for after three days. Um, as far as stress goes, it's good to incorporate music, um, some art, meditation, which uh, April will get into, and this will help de-stress your life. Um, it's been a rough year for everyone, and uh, we have to learn to be kind to ourselves. And um, and that's me sending a virtual hug on the bottom. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Thank Joe. You. This is Thank great. You. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Jill about some of the things she talked about? I realize that I'm with RVNA Health, so possibly shouldn't ask a question, but I, I do have one. Um, and I've asked this question before and I can't seem to retain it, but so your blood pressure is one number over another number. And is there a number on the top that we don't wanna go above? Is there a number on the bottom that we don't wanna go above or below? And is there an optimal difference between the two? Like what should we be aiming for? I'm never quite sure. Well, I mean, there were some changes to what the best optimal levels were. And with those new changes, it put a lot of people into, uh, you know, high blood pressure ranges. 
I mean, the perfect range has been 120 over 80. Um, you don't really want that bottom number to go over 100. Um, I've, you, the, the, the bottom number is the one that you have to watch the most. I mean, a hypertensive crisis, um, you know, is 180 over, you know, one, over 120 and over. Um, that's when it's considered a hypertensive crisis. So let me, let me just step in here. The American Heart okay. Association uh, came out with new guidelines. They're no longer new, but they came out with guidelines in 2017 for the evaluation and treatment of hypertension. And those replaced guidelines that were about five to seven years old. And in 2017, and the guidelines of 2017 were more strict. They defined a normal blood pressure as 120 over 80. Uh, they identified what's called elevated blood pressure, which is from 120 to 129 over 80. Uh, they also then defined hypertension in two stages. The first stage would be uh, 100 and, uh, uh, 130 to 139, or the lower number, the diastolic 80 to 89, and then stage two would be greater than 140 or greater than 90. Um, so it, those were much stricter than uh, guidelines before, and it got a lot of pushback from patients and doctors because it created some some uh, difficulties with uh, treating blood pressures too low. So um, those are the guidelines that are in effect now, but uh, they're applied uh, you know, judiciously in, in many people because you don't want the blood pressure to be too low. And we, it is in the handouts that new, the new guidelines are in the handouts. I have a question for you, Jill. I'm here. Um, do you, what is, the, is there a particularly best time of day to take your blood pressure? Yes, in the morning before you start activity. If you want to check it twice a day, if, you, if it's been going up and you want to keep an eye, check in the morning before you start your activity. And then in the evening before you go to bed, that'll usually give you your baseline. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Does everybody have the handout? It has the uh, updated blood pressure ranges on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It looks like Ann has a question, but she's muted. I'm unmuting. Okay. Hi, the Ann. guidelines are, are what you said, Ralph, but is that the same for a 35-year-old young man and an 80-year-old woman? Or? Well, it's a good question. Uh, however, I would tell you that the guidelines do not really differentiate on the basis of age. Uh, normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, and you know, the, the two stages are the same for someone who's 18 and someone who's 80. And that can create some issues for the 80 year old. So, but uh, no, the guidelines don't differentiate on the basis of age. Should they? Yes. I don't know. Should I, I'm just asking, should they? Uh, I would, I don't think so, because uh, certainly some uh, 80 year olds are very vigorous and uh, have associated medical problems, uh, coronary disease and uh, history of stroke, um, and they should be treated aggressively. So, I just wonder what the trade off is between adding so many more people to taking blood pressure medication and the side effects from those medications, whether it's kidney or other factors. Well, I wonder, you, I don't know if the answer to this is known, but I mean, drugs are just seems to me dispensed with such uh, impunity. I just, want, I just wonder about that. Well, there's no question that increasing blood pressure from 120 uh, over 80 and beyond with each 10 to 20 millimeters of increase in blood pressure, either the systolic or the diastolic, there's an increased risk of heart attack, stroke, uh, vascular disease, and heart failure. Uh, and that's the, that was the basis for making the 2017 uh, guidelines more aggressive. That didn't really answer the question. Yeah. Yeah. 
Dr. Kermzer, did you want to talk a little bit about in terms of medication and if there's a trade-off taking the, the blood pressure medication versus, you know, versus, versus, and the side effects that that might cause versus not? Well, the, the side effects of, of aggressive blood pressure treatment are primarily uh, creating hypotension, low blood pressure, and causing people to be lightheaded or, or or uh, propensity to faint. So that, that's the, the, the side effect. I mean, there are other side effects of, of many medications, but aggressive therapy can sometimes cause people to be weak, tired, uh, and uh, have a propensity to faint or even fall. So every patient has to be considered uh, individually. Thank you. I, I would say uh, in this day and age, uh, we, we, the recommendation for starting medication, if blood pressures are not uh, well controlled with uh, uh, you know, diet and exercise, weight loss, and alcohol restriction and so forth, uh, we usually start with uh, a mild diuretic, hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothaladone are uh, two of the most popular mild diuretics. Beyond that, we now recommend either what are called angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, medicines such as lisinopril and uh, 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 losartan or valsartan would be the medicines we start with most of the time now. Uh, also, there's a medicine, a uh, calcium channel blocker, uh, amlodipine, which is, which is very popular. Uh, and uh, considered to be a first-line drug for treating high blood pressure. Thank you. Most, most patients with high blood pressure need more than one medication uh, to control their blood pressure according to the, you know, to the degree of these new guidelines. Thank you. Um, Gigi, why don't we switch gears here and why don't you give us an introduction to the next, uh, next presentation about grip strength? And then we can come back to some of these great questions about medication and blood pressure for Dr. Kermzer. Uh, sure, and actually um, our presentation will show some ways to reduce your blood pressure without taking medication, so, which is one of the things. So I'm Gigi Weiss, I'm the director of rehab uh, here at RVNA Health. Um, I'm proud to introduce Sarah Triano, who's been with RVNA Health for over two years, but she's been in OT for more than 13 years. Uh, she works primarily with patients in our rehabilitation and wellness center here at RVNA uh, Health and uh, at our building here. Um, and she also works in our home care settings. Uh, she works with a variety of diagnoses, both orthopedic and neurological, ranging, ranging from rotator cuff to total shoulder replacement, um, tennis elbow, basic hand dysfunction. Uh, also works with Parkinson's patients and stroke patients. Uh, as her focus, um, as as um, as an, as an OT, her focus is um, devising patient-specific plans of care and meaningful goals to help individuals get back to their baseline functioning, uh, which includes ADLs, which are um, activity of daily living, um, which are kind of our everyday activities. Um, Sarah's learned a, earned a bachelor's of science in psychology from Iona, as well as a second um, bachelor's degree in health science and master's in occupational therapy from, from Mercy College. Um, she also holds a health counseling certificate. So uh, we're very proud to um, have her here. And she lives here in Richfield with her husband and two children. So now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Um, and she okay. will present. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'm Sarah. I'm going to talk a little bit about grip health and how it correlates with, uh, or sorry, grip strength and how it correlates with heart health. So let me just pull up my screen here. Okay. Everyone could see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So grip strength and heart health. Let's hit enter here. Ah, why isn't it clicking? There we go. Okay, so what is grip strength? It's a measure of the muscular strength or the maximum force or tension generated by one's forearm. So why is it important? So a strong, healthy grip makes life and activities of daily living easier throughout the course of one's life. So grip strength provides a snapshot of your overall health. 
Um, it can look at you know, how we reflect general body strength and muscle mass. It's a good indicator of one's biological age, which just gauges whether your body is functioning younger or at an older or older than your chronological age. And there's many studies that show a connection between both grip strength and um, the health of one's heart. So what does grip strength do as far as those activities of daily living? So when we say activities of daily living, we're talking about dressing, grooming, thinking about your morning routine, waking up, um, making your breakfast, <laughs> taking your medication. So how does grip strength make it easier? So when you think about dressing, you think about zipping your coat up, buckling your buckle, um, clasping your bra. You think about container management, which is opening and closing jars, which is probably one of the most biggest complaints that I see from patients when they come in correlated to grip strength. Um, they can't get jars open when they're trying to cook. They, they can't get their medicine open and they have to keep them open all the time, which can be dangerous in itself if you have other people around. Um, you think about cooking, so holding those heavy pots and pans, it's not only easier, but it's safer. Um, eating and drinking, so managing a fourth, fork, scooping with your spoon, um, taking a drink from your cup, wiping your mouth with a napkin. So all that you need grip strength. Now, what's the connection between grip strength and heart health? So there's a few studies that we'll go over, um, but in recent studies, uh, they've shown the following. So a, re a weak grip strength is a reliable predictor of cardiovascular disease. And this is even when researchers are adjusting for other uh, risk factors such as age, smoking, exercise, a sedentary lifestyle, et cetera. Um, hand grip exercise performed consistently over time not only improves the flexibility and function of the blood vessels, but like they were talking about before, it can lower your systolic blood pressure and increase the flexibility in the carotid artery. So the first study that we'll talk about is by Lancet. It's a publication that was published in 2015. Oh, I can't see the whole, hold on one second. Okay. Part of my slide is cut off by your beautiful faces, okay. So researchers measured grip strength in um, 142,861 adults. This was in 17 different countries, and they followed their health for an average of four years. At the end of this, the results showed that the connection between grip strength and cardiovascular disease was strong with each 11 pound decrease in grip strength correlating to a significant percentage of increase in heart disease, stroke, and heart attacks. So the lower the grip strength, the more likely um, that these people would incur heart disease, stroke, and heart attack. And the interesting thing was that grip strength pr proved to be a better indicator of cardiovascular disease than blood pressure alone, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, the second study was done by McMaster University in Canada. It was published in 2015. And this is where they took uh, 140,000 participants. They performed 10 grip exercises three times a week for eight weeks, working at only a 30% of their maximum voluntary contraction. So measurements were taken before and after completion of the program. And uh, they used a specialized hand grip device. We'll talk about that a little bit later to measure grip strength and then ultrasound measurements to look at the vessels. So what the res uh, research showed is that it concluded that hand exercises significantly lowered systolic blood pressure again. So same as the last study. And basically the systolic is what helps the heart pump blood to the rest of the body, as well as increasing that flexibility in the carotid artery. And the increase in the flexibility is a sign of healthy, healthy blood vessels. Um, the last study that we'll talk about here is by McGowan and colleagues. This was published in 2018. These eight participants, an average of 62 years old, all were taking blood pressure medication for high blood pressure. They performed four sets of isometric hand grip exercises. That isometric just means that you're, you're squeezing and holding the contraction. Um, they held that contraction for two minutes. They did this three times a week for eight weeks um, using both hands, so alternating hands. 
um, blood pressure and artery, again, were taken pre and post program. And the results concluded there was a significant drop once again in systolic blood pressure. And they saw that increase again in the flexibility in the arteries. So measuring your grip strength, how do we do that? We have a very fancy name um, for the device that we use, which is a dynamometer. It's basically um, a handheld device that an individual squeezes as strongly as they can. So the way we do it in the clinic is we give you the device and you could see the picture right here. So this is what it looks like. Um, in this round spot up here, you can it measures how, how much you're squeezing either in pounds or kilograms. So we do it in pounds. Uh, you'll take three times, you'll squeeze as hard as you can on the right, three different scores, and then you'll do the same thing on the left. At the end, we average out the three scores from the right, which is how we get your right grip strength, and we average out your grip strength from the left, and that's how you get your, uh, your pounds. So you'll see that it'll differ. So differ from male and females for normal grip strength. It's actually a pretty big range for what's considered normal. It's, it's anywhere from like a 30 pound difference. Um, so if you were a 70 year old male, less than 46 pounds is considered weak. More than 77 pounds is considered strong. And in between that is what's considered normal. Um, and then again, here is the normal grip strength for females. So again, it does it by age, what's considered weak, what's normal, and then what's strong. Um, so if you have no dynamometer, no problem. They do sell them online. And the one that we found um, was 90% accurate when compared to ours. So there is like a plus or minus five pound difference. You do have to be careful with the electronic ones only because you have to make sure if the battery goes low, it could be, it could be skewing the results. Um, but we do offer the number at the top. If you were to call that, you can schedule a free reading. It literally takes probably less than five minutes to do it. Um, but the important thing is that you get started with maintaining that grip strength now and, and strengthening it because your, your heart will thank you for it. So it's definitely, uh, definitely a plus. Now you'll see this, you've got this in the goodie bag. So you have one of these, you don't have to have it with you now, but if you do, you can take it out and we could just go over these six exercises. You'll see this little heart that was in it's, it's like the stress balls that you see in the uh, CBS, they sell them a lot of places. Um, so here there's a handout with six exercises to improve grip strength for heart health. Um, the normal routine would, would be to practice it twice a day. So two sets of each exercise and each exercise you would do 10 times. You don't necessarily have to split it into two sets a day. You could definitely do one set and then just double it. But the first one, so you'll see it's called the power grip. It literally is just taking the heart, okay? And you're, you're just squeezing it, okay? You're holding that contraction for a few seconds, up to five seconds, and then you're just letting go nice and slow. So you just give it a few squeezes. So you do that 10 times twice. So a total of 20. <clears throat> now the next one to the right says MCP flexion. When they're talking about your MCP, they're talking <laughs> about your knuckles here. So when you flex, if you could see my hand, um, if I didn't have the ball in my hand, you, it's almost like making that, that puppet character, okay? So instead you would take the heart put it in your hand and then you would just squeeze and hold that contraction and then relax. Um, and a lot of these two to modify them before I, before I um, end or go into the other exercises, mm -hmm. you can do these and just hold the grip. You don't have to use a ball. So if you're having pain, if it's too resistive, you can use something softer. You can use something harder if this, if you get too strong and this is too soft, um, but you can do them without the, the resistive material. The next one's called the hook grip, okay? And this is basically where you're taking, so if I didn't have the ball in my hand, you're almost trying to pinch your fingertips and your thumb together, okay? So it's almost like you're making an O and you just squeeze, okay? Pinch grip is exactly what it sounds like, but you're gonna do it with each finger. So you would start with the index finger and you would just pinch it between your index finger and your thumb. Okay, then you take your middle finger, same thing, 
and then your ring finger. It gets a little harder too. So it's normal to feel like your ring finger and your pinky are a little bit weaker. And then again, your pinky. And then the key grip. So you're thinking about how you're holding a key. You have your index finger on the bottom and your thumb's just gonna squeeze into the side of that index finger. So again, you're just gonna squeeze, hold the contraction, and then you relax. <laughs> Now you'll notice that the two bottom pictures look a lot alike, but the thumb placement looks different. So for the first one, your thumb's really, uh, it's, it's kind of bent at this joint and pushing down. For the second one, which is that lateral pinch, you're trying to keep your thumb joints all straight. Um, there we go, right there. Sorry. And you just hold the contraction. <laughs> Um, if you have any questions, please let me know, but don't forget about that service that we have, that if you do want to have your grip strength taken, like I said, it takes a total of five minutes. And that's it for this part. Any questions? Just get off here. Do you have any questions? That was so interesting. Um, how come this is a more widely known? It, it's am um, I just been living under a rock? I mean, I, this seems like so simple and beautiful now, way to, to. You're absolutely right. And if you noticed a lot of the studies, I did try to pick a lot of the studies, but it's coming out more recently. So from like 2017 on, you'll notice that there's a ton more of studies about this. Interesting. Who? I wonder how that was discovered even. I wonder too. <laughs> and if I find out, I will let you know. <laughs> I have a question. I used, I used this at, um, after I had a stroke. Yes. They gave yes. me the ball and I used it all the time. Yeah. So it's very popular after stroke. I mean, really with any hand dysfunction, whether it's neurological, whether it's orthopedic, um, you know, we use this arthritis. You know, they, they talk about range of motion, maintaining that range of motion. So you're really working on so much more than just grip strength. I mean, maintaining that range of motion, helping out with pain with orthopedic or arthritic problems. This is I have a question. Sure. So this, this is a, the grip ball or whatever they call it. Yes. Yeah. So this is, it, oh, yours is a little, oh, you, is yours in a heart shape? Oh, is yours a ball? Yeah. This one's a heart. Oh, it's, and I don't know how, I mean, it's pretty hard, but could we use, could she use that? Just yes. So you can, you can use anything. I mean, even if people can't tolerate um, the, the resistance of the ball, people have started out with, you know, rolling up socks together and starting to squeeze that. And as they get stronger, they can add it. Some people fill socks with rice, but you can get these in all different um, resistance levels. So they can go from light to heavy, but you can definitely use the ball. All right, I think her OT gave these to her when she was um, homebound. They're like little squeezy, rubbery. Food. Yeah, exactly. They're really soft. Yeah, those are cute. <laughs> I like them, they look like little animals. But anything that just provide, yeah, they're very cute. Anything that just provides some resistance for that hand strength. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions for Sarah? All right. Well, thank you. Thank I think you. I'll, I'll be using my, I'll be using my stress ball too. <laughs> it's, it's all good. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so our Thanks. next, uh, our next presentation is going to be about meditation. So this is another non-medication way of helping to manage your blood pressure. And it's going to be presented by April Rodriguez. And she is uh, a registered nurse who's been with RVNA Health for five years. Um, she began part-time with us as a community health liaison, and she's now the manager of community health and wellness for us. 
Uh, she went back to nursing school when her youngest was three years old and continues to increase her knowledge in holistic healthcare. Her belief is that our health is influenced by the, mi the mind, our body, and emotions. She's a certified yoga instructor and a Reiki practitioner. And when she's not working, she enjoys gardening, yoga, hiking, and spending time with her friends and family. Hi, everybody. Hey, bro. Okay, let me just get this up here. Okay. The reason we're talking about meditation is because it's wonderful for stress, uh, scientifically proven that it can help reduce stress among a lot of other things. So first of all, we want to find out what is meditation. Meditation is becoming aware of your mind and what's around you and just focusing on the present moment, focusing on what you're feeling at that particular moment. And to put it simply, it's just paying attention on purpose. So there's a lot of things that we go through our day and we just don't even realize half the time what we're missing. There's a lot of different forms of meditation. We have moving meditation. Uh, yoga is a form of moving meditation. Walking, um, Tai Chi, all other different exercises, mind-body exercises. Then there is a focus type meditation where you could just sit and stare at a candle and just focus on that flame or watch sitting at a stream and just watching the water flow by. Uh, you also have spiritual meditation where people might just pray or they might repeat mantras, which is a, a phrase that they just keep saying over and over. Then you have mindful meditation, which is becoming aware of your thoughts and feelings, every sensation in your body. So when it comes to mindful meditations, there's different ways you can do mindful meditation. One of them is breathing, just paying attention to your breath, paying attention to the movement of your body during your inhales and your exhales. Another form of mindful meditation is a body scan a guided body scan where you may listen to a recording and just focus on each part of your body and just notice what you're feeling at that moment. Um, mindful movement, again, sitting in a chair, eyes closed, just, you know, gentle movements, raising your arms up and down and just noticing, becoming aware of your, your arms moving in the air and what you're feeling as they move. Uh, you can also have mindful walking as you're walking. Just notice how your body feels as it's walking. Just, you know, notice the pressure on each foot as you take step with your right, step with your left. And you also have mindful eating. A lot of us tend to eat while we're watching TV or doing something else, but just stop for a minute and take something like a raisin. And first of all, just close your eyes and just Feel it in your hands, feel the texture of it. And when you put it in your mouth, just notice the texture, the taste. Is it sweet? Is it sour? Um, you know, is it chewy? Is it soft or hard? You know, these are little things that we don't stop to pay attention to every day. So when we talk about mindful breathing, it's very simple. A lot of these meditations are very simple. It's um, something that's always accessible to us. We can have it all the time, no matter where we are. And with everything going on today, how stressful everything is, even just watching the news, we can just become, make us very anxious, very stressed. So you just have to take five minutes, close your eyes, and whether you're sitting or laying down, and just pay attention to your inhales and exhales. Follow that breath all the way from your nose, down your throat, into your belly, and then follow it all the way back out. And just be aware of the sensations in your body, how, it, how it's making you feel.
Then we also have the body scan. Again, we could do this sitting up or laying down where you're just focusing on each part of your body separately and becoming aware of the sensations, uh, starting from head to toes or toes up. And body scan meditation has been very well known for helping with people ease chronic pain. Because a lot of the times when people have chronic pain, they will tend to do things to distract themselves from it and just to try and get their mind off of it. And studies have shown that if you focus on where that pain is, where your discomfort is, and just become aware of it, don't judge it, just kind of be with it in the moment. Um, you know, if your knee's hurting, how does it feel compared to the other knee? People, it has been shown that it decreases their pain once they start to really become aware of it and accept it. Uh, mindful movement meditation, uh, again, yoga, Tai Chi, chair uh, stretches like chair yoga. With these type of mindful movements, they're moving with the breath. So again, your focus is on the breath as you are moving. So again, this creates a mind-body connection and it brings awareness to the sensations and what we're feeling in our body as we move. Next time you go for a walk, walk slowly and just become aware of the experience. Notice, you know, as I said before, how your feet feel as you're walking. How do your hips feel? Um, do you find yourself, you know, slouching or standing straight as you're walking? Just again, force yourself to be in the moment. You want to be present. Uh, mindful eating we went over. So again, just try that tonight when you're eating. Just, you know, take a piece of food, close your eyes and just chew it slowly and just really think about everything. Notice every feeling, every bite, the texture, the taste, um, just to bring yourself into the moment. And we need to do this a lot more, even in the shower in the morning, just notice, become aware of how the water feels flowing on your body or how the soap feels as you wash yourself. Just, you know, take little moments like that because it's so important. So with meditation, it has been scientifically proven that Meditation doesn't have to be 30 minutes a day. You could do five, 10, 20 minutes a day. It's been known to decrease depression. It regulates anxiety and mood disorders, which right now anxiety is extremely high with not only seniors, but everybody right now with everything going on with the pandemic, uh, especially children. And even in schools, they use meditation to help children just relax and calm their anxiety. Uh, it's been proven that it helps improve focus and your attention, again, decreased uh, pain, and it can reduce your heart disease and strokes. It enhances short-term and long-term memory, and it decreases inflammatory disorders. And what's going on is by doing the meditation and relaxing the body, you're not releasing, releasing all of those harmful, you know, hormones that like cortisol that is just flowing in your body all the time, you know, which can do a lot of damage. So some statistics, um, meditation can improve anxiety by 60%. It can help with insomnia, approximately 50%. Um, in about 80% of people, it's been uh, proven to decrease their blood pressure. It can decrease symptoms of PTSD by 73%. And in just as little as four days of practice, it can increase your attention span. Because again, it, again, meditation, it takes practice, just like anything. You know, you can't expect to just sit down and, you know, know how to do it or train your mind how to do it. 
So to start a meditation practice at home, just start with five minutes. Don't, don't, because if you say, oh, I'm going to do 20 minutes today, you'll give it up in a few days. So you just find a quiet area to sit or lay down, gently close your eyes and just use the breath, for example, and just focus on your breath, something very simple to start with. And meditation isn't erasing our mind from any of our thoughts. It is quieting the mind. As you're meditating, even when you're focusing on your breath, you're going to notice thoughts come into your mind and that's okay. Just acknowledge them, don't judge them and just let them go and bring your focus back onto your breath. Don't become frustrated with them because that's part of who we are. Uh, some people, when they practice their meditation, they might use aromatherapy oils like lavender to help you relax at night. Um, or if they're laying down, they can use an eye pillow to help keep the darkness out, just to help them relax more. There's sound machines with uh, the sound of an ocean or of the wind. Um, some people will use a blanket because you might get cold during it. And there's also, if you have iPhones, there's apps on the iPhones that you can download, which have five, 10 minute meditations on them. And on the computer, there's tons of guided videos out there uh, to follow along and just guide you through a meditation practice. So you don't have to try and do it on your own. You have some guidance there. So what I'd like to do is run you through a short meditation and you can stay right where you are in your chair, just make sure you're comfortable and just relax. And I want everybody just to gently close their eyes. Just keep your arms and your hands just relaxed by your side, on your lap or however you like. And just bring your focus to your body and feel the weight of your body as you step <clears throat> into the comfort of your chair. And just start to notice where your arms and feet are making contact with the chair or the floor. And just as you scan your body, just start to notice if there's any part that's uncomfortable that you need to make adjustments just to help you settle into the meditation a little bit more. I'm gonna start with a few deep inhales through the nose and exhaling through the mouth three times. Again, inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. One more time, inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. Just keep focusing on your breath. And as you feel each exhale, just feel your body melting even more and letting go. And just notice on how soft your inhales and exhales are. Just trying to stay in the moment. And as I said, if thoughts come into your mind, just acknowledge them and let them go and just come back to the focus of your breath. And let's start bringing our attention to our feet and just noticing how they feel, whether they're in shoes, if the shoes feel tight or if they're in contact with the floor. Just notice any sensations that you might feel in each toe. Oh, I do it. Notice if they're warm, if they feel tingly or pulsating. And then we're going to slowly move our attention up our lower legs to our knees. 
And just become aware of the backs of our knees. Are they in contact with your chair? And how are they feeling today? Are they feeling strong? Do you feel like you need to stretch them? Notice if the right knee feels different from the left. And just become aware of any little sensation you're feeling. If during this time, if you come across any area of your body that may feel uncomfortable, use your breath just to breathe into that area and just help it to soften a little more. And just breathe positive energy into it. Again, keep focusing on the soft inhales and exhales. And now move your focus up your thighs to your hips. Notice how your hips are settled in the chair. Notice the pressure. Notice if you're leaning into one side or the other. And move it into your lower belly. Moving up, notice if your belly feels tight or light. Maybe you're hungry, maybe you just ate so you feel full. And use your exhale just to soften any tension you might be feeling in your belly. Move around to your back, up your spine. If you're leaning back against the chair, just notice where your back is making contact with your chair. Maybe your back feels tired because you've been on your feet all day. Just go from the bottom of your spine all the way to the bottom of your neck. Becoming aware of what's, what you're feeling. And then slowly move to your shoulders and your neck, place where a lot of us hold tension. Just take a couple of breaths here, inhaling into the muscles into your neck. And as you exhale, just feel those muscles soften, releasing tension. And then becoming aware as we move down from our shoulders, down our arms to our fingertips. Notice if they're nice and loose, just relaxing, leaning on the armchair, your lap. Notice how each finger feels. And then as you inhale, we're gonna move back up to our face, separating the backs of our teeth. Just allow your jaw to relax. Feel your cheek muscles just soften, your forehead soften. And with your next few breaths, just notice your whole body. <coughs> Notice, notice the relaxation. Notice just being present and where you are right now. Becoming aware of the space around you. And then slowly open your eyes, connecting with your surroundings again. And you could do this anywhere. You could be in a, in a car, on a train, 
anywhere you are, if you're feeling stressed, just close your eyes and just breathe and focus on that breath. Try and tune out any things surrounding you, any stress that might be going on. And it really, really helps bring the anxiety down, relax you, stimulate that parasympathetic nervous system. We always have it handy. Thank you, April. How's everybody feeling after that meditation? I see some smiles. <laughs> in the like, nice. <laughs> Do you have any questions? So you always hear that you're supposed to meditate, supposed to 20 minutes at a, at a session. Is that not true? I mean, is it as effective to do fewer minutes? Or? Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you can work your way up. It's, it takes practice, you know, to learn to sit there quietly, especially if we're not used to it, which most of us aren't, we're used to just go, go, go. So to say, oh, I'm going to start today, 20 minutes, sit down. You know, <laughs> it's like exercising. You know, we say, oh, I'm going to do an hour today and you give it up tomorrow because you're like exhausted, you know, <laughs> but no, five minutes is just as effective, you know, do a couple times a day. You know, if you can work your way up to 20 minutes, that's fantastic, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you should set goals like that for yourself. But if you could do five minutes here and there, it will be extremely helpful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there are certain breathing techniques alone, you know, inhaling to the count of five and exhaling to the count of 10, which will stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system and just calms you right down. It's very, very powerful. Yeah. Anyone else want to share how they're feeling right now? Great. I see Ann Newton over there looks very relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually done this and, and you're absolutely right. You can just slow your whole system down. I just get too busy and forget to do it. Right. We yeah. all do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a great app, um, Headspace, but I know that there's... Yeah. That's, I mean, it's very similar to what you just did. Yeah. Right. And you can set apps, apps like that. You can choose how long you want to do it for. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm looking at the time and I want to make sure there's plenty of time to ask Dr. Kerms or any questions that, that you might have related to heart health, our resident cardiologist here. April, that was great. Uh, but while I was doing it, I got two texts. So oh. <laughs> I suppose, uh, we should do that without our cell phone present. Yeah, please. Yeah, you should have muted okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was great. Uh, I just uh, want to say a few things about uh, high blood pressure. Um, uh, I, Jill, Jill's talk was excellent. And as a practicing cardiologist, I would advise anybody who is being treated for high blood pressure or who thinks they have high blood pressure that you go out and buy your own device. Uh, the, the ones that go around the upper arm, not the wrist. Um, and uh, one caveat about that is that they'll come with a standard cuff size. And more and more these days, we're seeing people who have larger arms than the average, the quote unquote average person. Uh, and uh, so if you are someone who has a large arm, uh, you, sh you should ask the pharmacist uh, for help on getting a, a separate cuff for your device. You can measure your arm in, uh, in inches or centimeters, whatever you want, and, uh, and have the pharmacist help you select the proper cuff size. If your arm is big and you use a standard cuff size, which would be too small for your arm, that will overestimate your blood pressure. So it's important to get the right cuff size. I just want to, and, and your home blood pressures are so much more helpful to uh, the cardiologist or your internist at treating high blood pressure than the blood pressures he, had, he or she takes in their offices. Um, and uh, uh, many times when people come in the office, their blood pressure is much higher than it is at home. Yeah. When you take your blood pressure, uh, you should do it uh, methodically. You should sit. Uh, 
at a, a table, preferably the table you eat at because it's at a good height. You rest the arm that you're gonna use on the table and that'll bring your arm about the level of your heart. You put the cuff on, you make sure you're, you're in a straight back chair, your feet are flat on the ground. You're not talking to anybody, you're not listening to TV and you wait five minutes. And during those five minutes, you can use some of the techniques that April just talked about. And then you go ahead and take your blood pressure um, and you get a reading, uh, wait two or three minutes, do it again, wait two or three minutes and do it again. Um, and uh, I usually think that the, the blood pressure you get on the third try is probably the one that is useful in terms of therapy or you can average them. Um, I would recommend, yeah, taking the blood pressure in the morning is a good idea, but I would recommend it doing it different times of the day. Typically, blood pressure is higher in the morning uh, and lower in the afternoon, depending on you know what, what kind of work you're doing or if you're not working. So uh, you, you d use different times of the day to check your blood pressures. Um, the, the 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 prevalence of high blood pressure is very high. Uh, and that's in part based on these 2017 guidelines, which are aggressive. But uh, if we know that almost half the people, in, uh, adults in the United States, either are taking blood pressure medicine or, blood pressure, or they have blood pressures that are greater than 130 over 80. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, if you are, have any concern about your having high blood pressure, get your own device and measure it yourself. Um, so are there, are there any questions? Uh, I know there's a concern about how aggressive um, we are now, in, uh, we are in terms of treating blood pressure, but we do it because there's good evidence that if you treat these lower targets, based on the 2017 guidelines, you actually do reduce uh, cardiovascular uh, outcomes. I have a question and it's always fascinated me about um, heavy smokers too, that only a tiny percent, small percentage of heavy smokers ever get lung cancer. So I'm curious in people, and there's so many people who have hypertension, never diagnosed and walk around with it. How come they're not all having strokes and heart attacks? What are the protections that some people inherently have or else they would all be in the hospital with strokes? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, look, there are, it's, it's like other lifestyle things in a sense, uh, people can get away with. I mean, heavy drinkers can sometimes get away without any health problems. Uh, people who are obese can get away without any heart problems or health problems. But in general, um, the higher your blood pressure, uh, the higher your risk is of having a cardiovascular uh, problem. Uh, some people are lucky. Uh, who are those people? Well, uh, it depends on their other risk factors, their cholesterol level, uh, their, uh, whether or not they have comorbidities like diabetes. Uh, a big one is family history. Uh, that's one thing you can't escape, and that's, that's a major, um, factor in terms of how you are going to do as a, as a person. So some people are lucky uh, with high blood pressure and get away with it, and many are not. A doctor? Yes. Uh, say, I was uh, very interested in your pauses. You said five minutes before you start and then two to three minutes in between readings. Yeah. I have AFib and typically the first reading may be the highest or if you go into the doctor's office and time is kind of it, it, important and things are rushed a bit, they're asking you questions and they take your blood pressure and it comes out a little high. If, if I had the time to pause, uh, I, I'm sure mine would be back to normal because my home readings are pretty good. Exactly why you are correct to be taking home readings and why not necessar necessarily to trust the doctor's office readings. I, you look, our own office, uh, it's, patients uh, come and go very quickly. Uh, 
and the blood pressures are taken as soon as they sit down at an exam table. And they're almost always higher than what people they get at home. And when I come in, uh, maybe they have to wait five, 10 minutes or so. I come in and I take the blood pressure and it's much, much lower than what the, uh, the, the medical assistant got when they uh, checked the patient in. So the home blood pressures are so valuable, so valuable. Um, now there are some people who won't take their home blood pressure because they get afraid, they're frightened. And uh, when they take their home blood pressure, it's too high, so they won't do it. One way around that is you can refer them for a ambulatory blood pressure monitor. It's a 24 hour uh, blood pressure monitor. Uh, a, a cuff is put around the arm and it's connected to uh, a, 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 a blood pressure uh, device. And about every 20 to 30 minutes, the blood pressure is taken. And um, that, that has a way of sort of uh, getting around patients' fear of taking their home blood pressures and also of, uh, of identifying people who have white coat, uh, high blood pressure. People who come into the office, they get so anxious that their blood pressures are through the roof. Sometimes you treat those people aggressively and when they're home, they're uh, feeling very lightheaded and uh, near fainting. So that's something you can do in some cases where uh, the patient either does not want to do home blood pressures or uh, for one reason or another. So interesting. Any other questions? Oh. Yeah. What's a fair trial for, say you, you have, your home reading shows you have a high blood pressure for diet and lifestyle, how many months in meditation, whatever else you're gonna do, lower your salt. What's a fair trial of those measures before right. you- so, Right, so it depends on what, what intervention you're talking about. Salt reduction, you, you'll get a, if, if you pretty much eliminate salt as much as possible from your diet, you'll get a significant drop in your blood pressure within a few days. Wow. Um, yeah, the, the, same, the same is true um, uh, with, with alcohol, um, although it would take a bit longer with alcohol, I would say a week or two in my experience. Uh, weight reduction, of course, is gonna take time. Um, meditation, uh, you know, I think if you, uh, obviously meditation will have an immediate effect. I mean, if you sit down, with your blood pressure cup, you take your blood pressure and then you meditate for 10, 20 minutes, you, you'll find an immediate drop in your blood pressure. And if you adopt that as a lifestyle, I think that uh, will have a immediate effect. Um, I just wanna say something about meditation. I'm not uh, someone who does it all the time and I would like to get better at that. But five years ago, I had um, a serious illness and I had this wonderful friend who is a doctor and is from India. And she came over at least twice a week, early in the morning and helped me meditate. Um, I think that if you know someone who's a regular meditation person that would help you enormously. It's not that easy when you start out. Um, and uh, it was just unbelievably helpful to me. So um, I think a lot of people do meditate. I know there's an app called Calm and our daughter uses that and um, enjoys it very much. But it's so interesting if meditation is new to you to see what people are thinking and say when they meditate. I mean, a real seasoned meditation person in a lot of cultures, you know, not the American culture, but a lot of cultures do start to meditate when they're children. So just a tip, you know, if you really want to get into it, it's nice if you know someone that could give you a little help. Is prayer a good form of meditation? Absolutely. I think it is. Yeah. That's good. I'm not wasting my time then. <laughs> not bad at all. <laughs> I would like to say that this has been a wonderful program. 
Excellent. So Absolutely outstanding. Yes, I thought it was just wonderful. Thank you all very, very much. Many thanks to RBNA for Thank um, you very much, RBNA. partnering with us and helping us in what is a very difficult time for everybody, I think. So um, we have Thank some you. real upbeat things. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Debbie. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Debbie. And I just wanted Debbie. to mention, Thanks, too, I, I, I do know that we tried to do a, a blood pressure clinic, and there wasn't very much interest in going to a, a site and doing that. But if anybody wants us to, do, uh, to check their blood pressure, or if you have a blood pressure cup at home that you don't know how to use and you'd like us to show you, feel free to give us a call in the Community Health and Wellness uh, Department. We could set up a time for you to come in. We can do something um, again with, with grip strength if you wanna get your grip strength tested at the same time. I know Gigi and Sarah would be happy to work with you as well. So even if you want a quick five minute in and out or 10 minute in and out uh, just to get everything tested or checked, we're happy to do that for you. So please reach out, let, let us know if there's anything that we can do. Um, I know everything's about COVID these days, but it's so important to think about your heart health as well. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Debbie, we really appreciate it. And to our presenters, Jill, April, and Sarah, and, and Dr. Krimzer, we thank you for your expertise and for all the knowledge that you shared. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you, ladies, so much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and for, for our group, if anyone has not received a bag and would like one, please give Janet a call. And we have a few bags um, that we saved for anyone who still needs one. Great. Thank you, RBNA. And thanks for being wonderful friends and sponsors of Stay at Home in Wilton. And I just yeah, want to you add guys. one thing. I wanted to add one thing that is a lot. I've had quite a few calls from people over the years that don't trust these home uh, blood pressure monitors. So what I've had them do is bring them to me Absolutely. and I test them along with, you know, taking their blood pressure with my stethoscope. So again, if you want those tested just to see how accurate they are, you can always bring them to us as well. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, even uh, with your own physician, uh, bring your device to your physician's office and have them check it for you. Mm -hmm. Great, Ralph. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Excellent. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Farewell. <laughs> <laughs>